plagiarism is on everybody's mind these days. And I'm always like, plagiarize yourself, like, you know, as much as you can. <laughs> so like something that I try and remember to do is like, if you actually have a good story or post is just keep, keep telling that story. Cause a lot of people have never heard it, even though you've heard it, you know, millions of times and probably all the people you think you've talked to have heard it millions of times. A lot of people have never heard it. Well, Dave McClure, uh, this has been a long time coming. I uh, met you in 2009 when you were going around Silicon Valley with your startup startup metrics and the whole pirates thing. So it's a pleasure to finally uh, get you uh, on the podcast. Welcome to Limited Partner Podcast. Thanks, man. Appreciate you uh, having me on. You guys have been doing some great episodes. Uh, thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you for listening and thank, thank you for, for sharing and tweeting about it as well. Um, so there's a lot of ground to, to cover. We have 2009 to 2024. So let's start, uh, you know, when you came to Silicon Valley and it was before, before I came, I came uh, January, 2009. So tell me about how you broke in. How did you break into VC? Uh, well, I don't think we want to cover everything, but I, I came out after graduating from Hopkins. I guess I stayed in DC on or Baltimore and East Coast for about a year, but I graduated in 88 and then came out in 89. Uh, originally was I was planning to head to Japan because that was actually where things were seemingly really exciting in the late 80s. And then Japan sort of blew up in the early 90s uh, to some extent. Um, and I really fell in love with California and uh, just ended up staying here. So originally when I came out, I was a software engineer, uh, client server development, and uh, was, was always interested in finance, but I didn't really have a, a traditional education in finance or business. But just being in Silicon Valley, you kind of, you know, the, the whole area is about entrepreneurship uh, that leads into, you know, finance and venture capital, as well as the tech side. Uh, and so I probably spent the first five, 10 years of my career just really figuring out, you know, the work environment uh, and and kind of morphing, transitioning maybe away from being an engineer uh, or geek into being more business marketing side, particularly when I started my first company kind of in the early, early 90s. Um, and you know, a lot to learn, made a ton of mistakes about <laughs> running my own company, but certainly a great lesson about how to learn, you know, managing people, sales, customer service, accounting, all kinds of shit that, you know, probably, I guess you could learn in school, but it's certainly more, uh, meaningful when you learn it on the job and you have to, you know, figure that shit out. Otherwise, you know, the company will, will hit a, hit a ditch. <laughs> um, Anyway, so I went, I went through that period of like, you know, doing that on the fly, uh, School of Hard Docs, and we ended up getting acquired for a small amount in 98, I think, and I stayed with the company maybe for another uh, year and a half through subsequent acquisition. But that sort of five to seven year period was a lot of the business finance learning for me, uh, particularly really getting, understanding customers and sales and marketing and accounting. It was like a lot of things that I really kind of figured out there. Um, and, and which, one, which one, which, which one of those things is critical for zero to one. So, you know, MBAs always ask me when they should join a startup. I say, either you have to found the startup or be 50th employee. What do you think about that? And, <laughs> and what, what skill sets do you actually need to run a startup from a finance a sales and accounting standpoint? The core things that you really want to understand in doing startups is building product, doing sales or managing, you know, people and those, and, and finance is kind of like on top of all that, I guess. Um, so, but it's, it's, you know, it's critical to measure and it's critical to understand, you know, how you communicate that to other folks, particularly investors. I guess I became interested as a student of venture capital in the nineties, um, and then sort of became an angel investor in the early two thousands and then gradually, you know, got into venture really, you know, later around 2008, nine, when I was working with Peter and Sean at Founders Fund. So, so let's talk, you had, you had a, one of the most creative ways to get into venture. And I always tell people there's no two ways to get into venture unless you're already in the space. Oh, but there there so, are two ways. The two ways to get into venture is go to one of three schools, which is like Stanford, yeah. Harvard, or Penn, I guess maybe throw a yeah. few more into there or yeah. make a fucking billion dollars. And then people ask you to be VCs yeah. <laughs> or, or I guess sorry, the other one is a celebrity entertainer or athlete. That's, that's also popular. First, become a famous DJ, and then then you might be able to to raise right. raise a rolling fund. Or these days, a retired general. That's another way to get into venture now. You are a seed to Series A celebrity, um, and, and okay. you would go around and give the same presentation. Uh, tell me about that. Tell me about the genesis um, and how that helped propel your career. Yeah, um, so it was it was interesting because originally it was me trying to figure shit out as a product manager, product marketer, with a few startups and. Um, you know, some of which I had sort of been thinking about when I was still at PayPal between 2001 and 2004. And, you know, that was 
obviously an amazing ride. And I got there just before the IPO and through the acquisition by eBay and got to meet a ton of amazing people at, at PayPal. Um, but really, I started trying to think about like as a startup founder or employee, you know, what do you do? How do you how do you figure out your daily set of tasks and and priorities? And it's really hard because when you're running a startup, there's like 20 different things you're trying to figure out. Um, and, you know, it's just very, very difficult to figure out like what's the most important thing. And and when I was working with a few companies, uh, probably particularly, I guess, Mint.com and maybe SlideShare and Mashery, I was trying to figure out like how do you make decisions about you know, product features and marketing and revenue and, you know, maybe viral campaigns at, at a high level. I think it's really the conversation about, do you build features? Do you do marketing scaling? Do you optimize for profit? Right. And so those are pretty big questions for entrepreneurs, particularly folks in the product team and the CEO about how do you decide what features to build, whether to scale and whether to focus on profitability and, and very, very difficult sets of, um, questions to answer, particularly when you're trying to tweak all of that at the same time. And and there are a bunch of us who were sort of working on those ideas, uh, Eric Reese most notably with the lead startup, um, but um, several other folks, Stephen Shaw, Kismetrics, um, uh, Steve with uh, uh, Steps to the Epiphany, I guess. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of people who are really trying to like, how do you make startups more scientific or more process oriented? Uh, and we're all kind of struggling with like, what's the best way to think about that? Right. And for me, it was like, well, let me just put this one idea on a single sheet of paper, um, which was really around, you know, four or five topics. And I was playing around with how to come up with a marketing, you know, angle or, you know, strategy of that. And I, I came up with this idea of like, well, let's let's use these five words and these acronyms, A-A-R-R-R, acquisition, activation, uh, retention, referral, revenue, which spells R. And that sounds like you're a pirate. And I was like, oh, okay, startup ventures from pirates. And that sort of stuck. I just kind of kept using that as a one-trick pony and pretty much beat it to death for probably at least two or three years, maybe five or more. Um, and other people started using it. Um, several other people, I think probably one of the most notable ones was Drew, Drew Houston, Houston at Dropbox, you know, yeah. gave me a nod at one point. So I think Sean Parker had somehow seen my stuff in several decks and presentations that he'd been seeing. He's like, who the fuck is this McClure character? You know, let, let's try and get him in for some marketing. <laughs> and so he was looking to hire me to work at Founders Fund for marketing. And I, of course, wanted a job in DC, not marketing. And I was like, yeah, fuck off. I'm going to raise my own fund. Um, and then the market blew up in, you know, summer 2008. I kind of came crawling back and said, hey, Sean, is that job still available? And can we horse trade? Can we get some money to, you know, do a little bit of investing? We'll, we kind of wheeled a deal. He gave me, you know, allocated about $2 million out of uh, Founders Fund 2, which I think was $220 million. So basically, like, here, take 1% of our fund, you know, do some angel investing, do some marketing for us, you know, try not to hurt yourself <laughs> and go off and, you know, have fun, which which was an amazing opportunity at the time. This was Q4 2008 when nobody, you know, was getting hired in venture. People were basically, like, in shock. You know, I think Sequoia did that. Uh, you know, Tombstone post or something about, you know, nuclear R.I.P. Or... startups. R.I.P. startups, right, right. R.I.P. Was... Good times. R.I.P. Good times. That was it, right. Yeah. Um, so they were like, the world is ending or nobody was getting hired venture. I didn't have a traditional venture background. Somehow I got this gig because Sean, you know, saw my stuff in a bunch of pit deck, pitch decks. And I, I guess I worked with Peter and some of the other folks at PayPal. So it was just, you know, tremendous opportunity to get into a venture with a really amazing firm and brand. Um, for someone who didn't have a traditional background in either business or finance and hadn't made a bunch of money, like that was just, you know, a great opportunity. Some would say you got lucky, but I would say the harder you work, the luckier you get, you know, so, somewhat of a trite, trite thing. But I think over and over what I see people that have opportunities in venture put themselves in that opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of people producing content for venture these days in multiple forms um, and yourself included. Uh, but I, but I do think you know, not just in venture, but in any con, any industry, you, you know, when you're trying to establish yourself and become known, you know, you have to try a lot of different things. Um, and I always tell people like an easy way to get started is just write every week <laughs> for a year. Like if you did a blog post every week for a year, you'll produce 50 pieces of crap. 10 of them will be okay. And maybe two or three of them will be really interesting. You know, it's sort of like portfolio theory is, you know, just be consistently out there writing your thoughts and ideas and a couple of them will hit. You know, and, and so that's, but, it, but it's challenging for people to write weekly, um, you know, for a year. That's not, it's not an easy task for anyone if you haven't been doing that. Those are kind of the same numbers I usually think about for venture portfolio. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, if you're consistently, you know, putting stuff out there, even if it's not very long, you know, probably once or twice, you'll figure out something magical or something will connect with people. And often times I found, even though I did a lot of writing earlier in my career, not so much these days, there are really only one or two or three things you sort of need to catch people's attention with, and then you'll stick in their head. Um, and so for me, at least in the beginning, that was started with Metro Truth Pirates. So, you know, I say that I've been giving talks for like 15, 20 years, but there's probably only three original thoughts that I ever came up with in my life. <laughs> but I said those three original thoughts a hundred different ways, right? And, you know, sometimes it doesn't always catch people until you get the right, you know, version of that. Peter Walker of Carta just did a post on December 31st going up through his yearly posts and uh, how many, what percentage of all his views came from one post a month? The power laws of social media, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Plagiarism was on everybody's mind these days. And I'm always like, plagiarize yourself, like, you know, as much as you can. <laughs> so like something that I try to remember to do is like, if you actually have a good story or post, you just keep, keep telling that story because a lot of people have never heard it, even though you've heard it, you know, millions of times. And probably all the people you think you've talked to have heard it millions of times. A lot of people have never heard it. Well, as a reminder, it's not plagiarism if you cite. So it's, it's totally <laughs> yeah, legit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and this case, so you had Sean Parker saw you in a, in a bunch of decks. And I'm sure he saw you in multiple decks before he even reached out to you. So you got you got the $2 million, You got less than 1% of the fund. What did you do with that $2 million? Uh, Well, I tried to stretch it out and make it last as long as I could. And so I did about 20 investments that were average ticket size 100 k they, they varied between 50 to 250 k uh, I kind of got really lucky. I got into Twilio super early. I got into Credit Karma super early. I got into SendGrid super early. Um, and then and later I also, you know, grabbed the Facebook fund budget and got into Lyft and a few other things. But uh, the, the two million that I invested on them returned, I think, 180 million. So, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. I think it was two and a half million. So probably closer to like 60x. Uh, but that took like 10 years. So like nobody knew at the time. And and in fact, they didn't, they didn't think I was that great an investor initially. Um, so I, I, I didn't really get my contract renewed with them after a year. And I, that was the reason I started 500 in a lot of ways. The four bets that really paid off for me were all better than 100x. Um, so uh, Credit Karma was probably like 400x. I think Lyft was close to 300x. Twilio and Sendway were around 200x. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, I, I don't take credit for all of that. I was in the right place at the right time in a very low valuation environment, but I didn't completely fuck it up either. <laughs> and, it, and it wasn't just one big win. It was like four big wins out of 40, which is a really unusually high hit rate. Statistically speaking, it's highly unlikely that was luck. Uh, but but uh, among those four, so how would you categorize those four in terms of, did you think that they were top quartile of your portfolio? Were they completely random? What, what inkling did you get that they were, would be your breakouts? I, I didn't. I mean, I, well, I kind of knew with Jeff and Twilio that, you know, he was a rock star and that was going to be a big opportunity. With the other ones, I think I had some intuition, but I didn't know, you know, they were going to be as big as they were. Uh, and definitely there were other companies that I thought were going to be big that weren't, and other ones that I didn't think were going to be big uh, that weren't. <laughs> um, and so there's like, you know, errors on both sides and expectations, which, which was, again, a lot of the philosophy behind why I started 500 and why we went large portfolios. I just generally feel like most people's stock picking intuition is wrong, and and they're, you know, they're there is survival bias for people who do very well, and they sort of think that they are smart, and other people think they are smart because maybe they just got lucky, um, and probably for some people, I think they are able to identify, you know, really good bets and potentially that pay off, but I think it's just very difficult to understand at seed stage whether things are going to be really really large, and and. And I generally think that people are full of shit when they're saying that they can tell that. Like, I, I think it's probably detectable to determine good from bad, but great from good is really hard without a lot of time. Nobody thought that portfolio was amazing a year in, even two or three years in. It wasn't until eight years later that it was like, oh, okay, this is obviously a really fucking amazing portfolio. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, we got a, you know, a 60x return on a two, two and a half, three million dollar portfolio with more than one big win. On a pure on a pure multiple basis, that that's likely a top ten vintage of all time. Oh, now it's wait, two and a half million. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it's more like top two percent. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm no, top able... ten, top ten. Period. I've seen I've seen a hundred x. I've seen a one forty x. I've seen two hundred x. But I haven't seen that many over fifty. Uh, Harry Stebbings, all credit goes to him. He, he's been he's been uh, 
he's been organizing the top performers, but 60X is, is fairly exceptional. So then you went, you went to- But, but what's FB interesting about that is also looking at the underlying drivers for those portfolios and was it just one company or not? Or not? So I don't think that's as impressive. Like, like Keith Reboys and Chris Sacker were also really large. Uh, like I think they were both in the 100X or so category, but they both had more than one big winner. And so it's not as impressive when you talk to somebody who's like, oh, I had like you know, 100X or something. If it was just one company, I'm like, ah, whatever. Maybe you're just fucking lucky. If it's two, like, oh, okay, that's interesting. We start to get like three or four big wins. You're like, okay, there's something going on. Extreme absolute performance on an individual company basis is not so notable. It's, it's more like getting 20X winners more than once is more impressive than 100X winners. And so really looking at the absolute portfolio return isn't as interesting as what's the construction of that? Is it one big outlier or is it multiple, you know, companies? Everything sort of ends up being a power law distribution at some point, but it's interesting if you get more than a few, you know, 20, 50 X sort of outcomes. Certainly a predictive of of future results. Well, but that takes 10 years. That takes 10 years to happen and the market conditions have changed. And so now you're chasing, you know, an environment that was 10 years ago. Is that really going to happen again? Like that person's already super fucking rich. You know, they're not going to work as hard or maybe they are. So it's, it's really hard to connect those conditions to the amount of time frame that is required to detect success or really outlier success in venture. Is, it's just a super long lag time and, and market conditions change within, you know, just a couple of years. So, you know, it's hard to say what, what really drives a lot of that. So let's let's move on to the FB fund. So you went from the FF fund to the FB fund. This was with Facebook. So tell me about uh, that. Well, all of that really happened around the same time. I was still working for Founders Fund. The reason was I was kind of running out of that two million dollar budget, so I didn't didn't have a lot of money left. I was like looking around for other budgets, and Founders Fund and uh, and uh, Excel had already done this joint venture that was like I think it was like five mil each. It was like ten million dollars for this FB fund. Uh, which was originally administered by Facebook employees. And it was originally a grant-based program. And they'd started that like a couple of years before me. So it was really like they deployed about 4 million of the 10. And then they kind of lost interest because Facebook was doing really well anyway. And I was like, hey, can I take over that program? And can I have some of that budget? <laughs> and so uh, really, really amazing opportunity to, you know, do sort of a, a corporate-led accelerator program, um, but, you know, with some amount of capital and, as a result of that, you know, sort of flipped it from a grant-based program to a convertible note structure, which, which was great because, you know, we ended up getting this huge, <laughs> you know, I, I think we invested a million, but we returned like 30 or 40, mostly because of Lyft, but also because of uh, Wildfire and Life360. So you glossed over that. You invested a million dollars and you returned 30 to 40X again? Yeah. So uh, this one we were doing, I think, uh, roughly 25 to 100K checks. Um, and so about 20 companies roughly 50k each um, the big driver for that was 100k check into lyft which at the time uh was called zimride uh after uh john zimmer i think was one of the co-founders there um and it wasn't really the same model at the time it was more of a, a ride share program for universities and corporates and they were using facebook connect as kind of one of the angles um and in fact they'd already gone through the grant-based program before i had been running it and i sort of seated a little bit and said, hey, would you like some more money? <laughs> and they kind of agreed to go through the accelerator program, sort of, again, uh, but really, I think they were just looking for capital at the time. And so we got a 100K check in and a 4 mil cap uh, in Lyft, which obviously turned out to be a great you know, investment. Uh, and so that was the big win. Um, but then we had two or three other pretty decent sized wins. Uh, Wildfire was a company that was acquired by Google for about 300 million or so. Uh, a few years after we had put money in at, I think, again, right, maybe around a $5 million valuation. Uh, and we also put some money into a company called Life360, which later went public on the Australian stock market. Again, took took a long time, 10 years later, but eventually became a unicorn. Uh, and I think for us, it was maybe on the order of a 20 to 40x sort of outcome. I think Wildfire was similar, was 20 to 40x. And we also had some small early exits. Uh, you know, not super huge, but a couple of, you know, five to $10 million exits that came out of them as well. So, so you have a 60X, you have a 40X. But, but yes, but, but we didn't know those at the time. <laughs> like nobody knew those portfolios were going to be fantastic. And to, to, I bet you if you asked Peter and Sean, they both thought I was a fucking idiot and didn't really, you know, hire me uh, to continue working at Founders Fund. And, and that wasn't really what I was going for anyway. I was you know, wanting to run my own fund and running one of the large portfolio strategy, which was very different. 
than what they were doing. Um, but it only became obvious over probably six, seven, eight years that that was going to be a, a really amazing portfolio. Um, so I was still hustling to find a job, even though I had worked at Founders Fund and, and done these two programs with Facebook and sort of this in-house FF fund. I was still building my career in venture. And, um, you know, so I, I really had to start 500 if I wanted to get a job in venture. I still wasn't hireable in venture. <laughs> When people complain about, you know, nobody's giving me a chance, this is the story I'm yeah, going to use. Yeah, totally, man. Like, in 2008, I tried to raise a fund. Fucking impossible time to get a job. I got lucky. I got into the Founders Fund. I got lucky again getting the opportunity to run the FE Fund. Still wasn't going to be a job for me, even after running those programs for a year, year and a half. And so I still pretty much had to start my own fund. I mean, if, if Josh Koppelman had given me a job at First Round Capital, I would have jumped at that. Like, you know... I, I thought Josh was great. I really wanted to work for Josh. He didn't hire me. He, he was kind enough to write me a check into my fund, but I think it was more like because I was annoying and he was like, stop calling me, sending me emails. <laughs> Here's 100K, shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, so it really did take, you know, four or five years of angel investing, another two years of, you know, working with Founders Fund and the Facebook Fund as a, you know, PC before I even had a shot at doing things. And even then it was like, I still had to kind of, raise my own fund i wasn't going to get hired by anybody else i i can tell you this was a probably story i didn't tell <laughs> i remember asking for rule of buffa for some advice i'd worked with him at paypal and he was at sequoia and you know he'd obviously done some amazing shit at sequoia i think youtube was pretty much his first investment um but i don't remember what it was i asked him about hey is there an opportunity at sequoia and he pretty much like totally sent me the most humbling email ever which is like not to put it too uh crisply but like you have no fucking shot dude <laughs> and, and he was trying to be kind and polite about it but he was very clear about like dude you have no chance coming to sequoia <laughs> why what was the rationale uh i hadn't gone to stanford i hadn't gone to mit or harvard i hadn't started a billion dollar company i you know i was old i was in my 40s at that point maybe 30s or something you know he's like dude you are so over the hill and not you know, <laughs> you know, you're asking about joining the major leagues and you barely can make division one, you know, and, and it was, it wasn't wrong. It, it was, you know, harsh feedback, but, you know, probably accurate feedback and made me realize, okay, that's not the path that I'm going to be able to access. I, I need to figure out a different path. And, and so it was useful feedback. It sounds like it wasn't, it wasn't written in a mean spirited way. It was a tough. No, love. the fact that he replied was like, I mean, great. I mean, then get, you know, we, we occasionally had a coffee or lunch and he was telling me about like, you know, his investment in YouTube and why that didn't make his career either. But I'm just like flabbergasting and walking through the venture map on that deal. Um, but, you know, you know, I knew all these amazing people at PayPal. It didn't mean that I was going to get a job in venture. <laughs> and so it took it took a while. It took a while and you had to really keep at it. So I, I agree with you people who are like, oh, shit, I don't, you know, somebody didn't have me a check or something. Yeah, good luck, man. It took me 10 years to even like get into the fucking field. You know, and, and I'm a white guy who did go to a good school, worked at PayPal, you know, has his capital. And even it's hard even for, you know, someone privileged like me to get in. Super fucking hard for anybody who isn't, you know, white or male or didn't come from the right, you know, background. Well, ultimately, DPI is a great equalizer. So DPI always <laughs> catches up. DPI ten, is great. Ten years uh, later. Uh, yeah, ground, sure. ground truth. So, so moving on to 500 startups, what was the original premise for 500 startups? Uh, I wasn't a great stock picker and I better have a lot of companies if I want to have a few winners. <laughs> um, and, and I think that was sort of just my general analysis when I've been doing the research for venture one. And when I've been talking to other investors, it was pretty clear that, you know, most big wins are, are infrequent. Most wins are infrequent and, and big wins are really infrequent. And, and so you had to kind of balance this, you know, story between people who had concentrated portfolios and had success and you're like, was that just luck and survivorship bias. Like, what's the real path, you know, to sort of having a safe portfolio? And at least for my analysis, it was like, well, you're going to have a lot of failures. You might have a few winners, but you really need lots of shots on goal to have any chance at those winners. And and later I wrote about this, um, you know, and I, I think I would say I, I don't really feel comfortable doing early stage investing, seed stage investing, unless you have 100 or more investments. Um, and at least when I look back at the numbers that we had from 500, you know, 50 to 70% fail completely, 20, 30% maybe have some positive outcome. Eight to 10% have, you know, sort of 20X or better, you know, sort of significant outcomes. Those are probably 100 million plus size exits. And maybe only two or 3% can get to IPO size 
you know, billion dollar outcomes that are fifty percent breakout. More. Yeah. And so the, the math is sort of like, okay, well, 2% do 50 to 100 X. That's really what drives most of your term. Maybe another five to 10% drive a 10 or 20 X, you know, and then you have a long tail of shit. Right. And so it's really those very small number of outliers, which for most people is like one or zero, right? Like if, if the number of times you get a big outcome is 2%, you know, unless you have 50 companies, you probably don't even have a 50, 50 chance of getting one of those. And it's, sort of true that whether you're smart or just lucky, if you have a concentrated portfolio and you do have a winner, you're going to have a better outcome than if you have a larger portfolio and winners. Um, but I think it's safer <laughs> uh, as a large portfolio investor that you're not likely to lose money, or at least you'll probably do you know no worse than 2x. Yeah, I think I think there's a couple of things at play here. One is the very top LPs, the one that, that approach it as a business, they already have exposure, right? So they might have you know, 10 managers that have 20 positions. So they already have a 200 portfolio exactly. company. Correct. They would, they want you to be taking these, these large, they want you to have risk. concentrated risk, right? Which, which for them is fine. But for you, it's sort of the same thing that a VC does to entrepreneurs. They want you to take a lot of risk, but might result in the entrepreneur flaming out and, and they don't, you know, I don't want to say they don't care, but they have a diversified strategy. And the same thing is true for fund of funds. They also have a diversified strategy. And so as an individual VC, I was like, well, fuck, I don't want to take the risk of having a shitty portfolio, a shitty return. Um, but it might have been in opposition to what a more traditional LP with from a fund of funds might be looking at. This is actually a math equation. So you mentioned the two to three percent breakout. Typically, two percent is kind of like the the median. I think for for us, it looked like the data was three percent. Right? I think I was I, I was better than average, but only by a little bit. <laughs> and even Sequoia and other people, I think, are only doing like five percent. So they're not like way out. Of, yeah. And other, other pockets of excellence, like early YC, Teal Fellows, are also roughly around 5%. When you look at, it's a math equation, when you look at the odds of something being a non-breakout, it's 0.98. So it's 0.98 to the 30th, if you have a 30-company portfolio, that's a 54%. That means there's a 54%, a 50-50 shot that you hit a breakout or not, if you have a 2%. Right, which is like too risky. Like, you want a 50% chance of failure? Yeah, once you take it to 50, it's 36. And once you take it to 75, it's 22. The nice thing about it is if you do have those professional investors backing you, they will typically back you for a minimum of two vintages, usually three if you're doing okay and you have some markups. I think the idea that you don't completely know anything, you don't have any markups is is a little bit of a misnomer. It depends on your own self-confidence. Like, do you think you're a 2% hitter? Do you think you're a 3% hitter? Do you think you're a 4% hitter? You're probably not a 4% hitter. So you're probably somewhere between a one and three. So it's a lot of it, it, it is a math equation, but there is a misalignment between LPs and GPs that doesn't go explicitly talked about. Most VCs are not good mathematicians. And, you know, that's not even the thought process for people. It's like, am I a good stock picker or not? It was like, oh, yes. You know, ask, ask any person like, hey, are you a good driver? Like 90% of, of US drivers probably think they're above average. <laughs> I think that's true of VCs as well, which is everybody thinks they're a great stock picker. But do you have a really, do you have data that really shows that you are a good stock picker? Um, and so I, I was deathly afraid that I was not a good stock picker in my previous five years of angel investing and even the founders fund. I was like, well, it doesn't look like more than 10 to 15% of my companies are successful. So I need more shots on goal. I wanted to have three to five outliers, you know, per portfolio. And, at, you know, at 2%, if you're only getting one out of 50 and you want three to five, now you're talking about, I don't know, 150 to 250 companies per portfolio. And so that was really what we were going for. You know, no secret, the name of the company fund was 500 startups. It wasn't five or 50 startups. It was 500 startups. <laughs> How many vintage? Was that second vintage or third vintage? When did you hit 500? Uh, by, the sec by the second fund. So first fund was 265 companies. Second fund was 325. So we, we had 500 companies, I think roughly four years in. Okay. I, I'm getting excited. I, I smell some data coming. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's see what the data revealed. Uh, so uh, I'll make my own predictions here. I imagine you did, you did uh, based, based on your track record, I imagine you probably had 3% breakout uh, and probably first fund did somewhere between a seven to 10 X. We're still in the game because that fund is now 14 years old and it's three X DPI and another four or five X unrealized. Um, so we'll see where it ends up. I don't think it'll be any worse than five or six net and hopefully it'll be more like six, seven, eight X net. We'll see, which, which is already really, really good. I think it's probably high teens or low twenties. Um, largely that result was because of talk desk. So a lot of people thought Twilio was going to be our big win. And it, and it was when I was managing the founder stock portfolio, because the entry valuation there was, you know, basically three and a half, <laughs> three and a half million. Um, 
and I did a personal investment in the company before I started 500. Uh, that was around seven or eight. I rolled that into the fund. But our, our bets on Twilio in 500 Fund 1 were actually really done at the Series B and C rounds. So they were much higher valuations. Still, still good bets, but probably only 20x returns overall on that one. Um, so Talk Test was the really big win. Um, still not public. I think you know recently uh, raised at a $10 billion valuation a couple of years ago. It's probably not you know a 10 these days, but still it's going to be a thousand X or better return. And it's already you know, partially okay. realized from some secondaries. Uh, on a TVPI basis, how, how much is that one is top desk? Uh, again, partially realized, partially unrealized. So it's probably one, 1. 1.2 of the existing three X, maybe 1.5 of the existing three X DPI, but it's probably most of the unrealized DPI. If I do my math, roughly four to four to five X on a TVPI basis of the entire fund. I think that's pro- probably about right. And if we didn't, Maybe not done the partial secondary sales earlier. We might have gotten more out of that. Um, if we held on to some of the Twilio position after it IPO'd, we might have gotten a little bit more out of that. Um, but we, we probably got 1x before any of the talk desk happened. And then we got another 1x from some partial secondary and talk desk. And I think now there's been another 1x from a few other things like uh, maybe Payne and I can't remember what the other stuff was, but you know. So when you were going out to raise Vintage 2, where were you with Vintage One? Oh, I don't think there was. I don't think there was any measurable performance. Other than that, we had had some. You know, I was still riding the Twilio SendGrid uh, Credit Karma. You know, vibe from really from Founders Fund when we were raising Fund Two, and I think we were known for doing a very different strategy that was large portfolio. Probably at that point, we'd started to do some of the global stuff, um, and you know, we were competing for attention with other seed firms and other accelerator firms at the time, uh, but it was still a very difficult, things didn't get easy on fundraising ever. And I would say really not until fund three did we start having some Is that success. because you were you were contrarian to yes. the, the general, yeah, the concentration thesis? Right, yeah, I, mean, I always say that, you know, 500 as a strategy was great for our returns, but terrible for fundraising. It just made it really, really hard. Because we, we were doing everything that people thought was wrong. Like we were doing large portfolio, we were doing accelerator, we were doing the international stuff. I was, you know, swearing and walking around in shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops and, you know, just didn't didn't look or smell like any successful VC, <laughs> at, that, at least at that point. And even at the time, I think, for reference, like YC wasn't viewed as such a great strategy, I would say probably until 2012 or 13 or later. Like, I can't remember when, when Dropbox and maybe Airbnb were getting to a certain larger scale. That's when people started thinking YC was a good idea. But there was still a lot of controversy about YC even five years in, right? And and so, you know, when we started, which was around 2010, YC was already five years old. I think Techstars was four years old. And so nobody thought those strategies were necessarily great ideas. So as, as LPs and as somebody who wants to find alpha in the market, how do LPs find kind of front run non-consensus developments in the industry? What would be your advice? I think most LPs are traditional and so they buy buy, buy they buy brands and success. They don't buy contrarian. They buy lagging indicators, not leading yeah. indicators. Were you inside like were you very confident or were you still like, holy shit, it still might not work? Like Oh yeah. I was fucking scared shitless. <laughs> I was I was scared shitless it wasn't gonna work. I was like, I don't know. I obviously you want to put on, you know, the confident front. And I, I did think there was a lot of, you know, uh, good reasoning for large portfolios, good reasoning for international portfolios, good reasoning for an accelerator program, at least, you know, a good accelerator program. And so it wasn't like I wasn't a believer in my own strategy, but I was sure as hell not perfectly confident it was going to work. And you know, just knowing how long venture takes, it's going to be five years before you really can assess whether you're even on target <laughs> or not. And and we were we were racing. Like I I don't remember if I told this part of the story, but the first when we did our first close, we were like late by three or four months during our first close. I had a ton of deals stacked up that I'd made commitments to and was trying to hang on to them so I could get the check written. The day that we did our first close, I wrote three checks on blank checks. They were like starter checks. <laughs> I, I wrote a down payment for our accelerator, the, the lease on our accelerator building the next day for like, I don't know, I think it was like 300,000 or something on a starter check. Um, we did 30 deals in six days when we first got started. 
And I remember talking to Gun- Gunderson hadn't seen anybody do 30 deals in a month, much less in a week. And we, we did 30 deals right out of the gate. <laughs> I think we did 75 deals in the first half year. And then we did another 150 in the fall next year, which was just an insane fucking pace that nobody, I don't think anybody had done that pace at that time. Sam Altman took over from Paul Graham running YC. And I know... Sam had been checking on a couple of things. <laughs> like we, we were chasing YC. YC was way out in front of everybody else. But I know he had been checking on our female founders, our international founders, and I know he started increasing batch size. So for whatever reason, it seemed like YC thought what we were doing did make sense and started to increase batch size, started to do more international, started to do more investment in women uh, and maybe minorities as well. Those are the things we were trying to differentiate from YC and Techstars when we got started was invest in underdogs, invest in more women, invest in more international, invest in more minorities, and, and increase the batch size like crazy. And, and and then you started to do the international. So, so tell me a little bit about the brand the brand expansions. If you want to go back for where the international stuff came from, it was a long time back when I was still at PayPal. And I'd been doing research on sort of international markets and growth. And it was pretty clear to me then, it was probably 2003 or four, that there was big opportunities in international markets Particularly, I think, you know, what I noticed was Asia uh, was a huge opportunity, not just China, but Southeast Asia as well. India was a big opportunity. Spanish-speaking markets were a big opportunity. Arabic-speaking markets were a big opportunity. And Africa eventually. And so for me, kind of like this concept of Global South and those emerging markets was clearly, if you just looked at the math, you know, you looked at the population growth, the internet penetration, smartphone adoption, um, you know, growth rates in those GMPs. There was, there was going to be a point in time when those markets became maybe not as big, but very big and meaningful. And so when we started, it was only about 20% of our strategy, but we already were making bets in India, in Brazil and Mexico, to some extent in Europe, uh, even in you know other places like Indian Africa on a limited basis. And we were hiring people in those markets as well. Um, and we started these you know geographic funds in a bunch of countries. Uh, you know, Southeast Asia as a region, uh, Thailand and Vietnam, individual countries, Japan and Korea, um, Mexico for the Latin American team, primarily Canada, which isn't really that international, I guess. Um, and then a few other places in uh, Europe uh, and Middle East as well. Fast forward uh, to, to 2020. So you went into the market, you saw an opportunity to do secondaries, LP, GP interests. So tell me a little bit about that that opportunity set and, and what is practical Venture capital. Yeah, venture capital isn't practical is really the joke about that. <laughs> so we're trying to make it more practical. Um, and I guess if you look at 500 startups as an exercise in solving uh, diversification and volatility, sol- solving vol- volatility, unpredictability with diversification and large portfolios, uh, which I think we were successful at, um, practical venture capital or really secondaries are an attempt to solve the time horizon liquidity problem and trying to get faster DPI. And, and hopefully also, you know, lower risk profile as well. And it's really started from, you know, our exercises in running multiple funds under 500 startups. We we sort of built, in a way, this internal fund to funds program starting around 2013, 14 or so. And we had started, you know, roughly 20 or so small funds in about 10 different geographies. And and some of those funds were breakout. Like, so, you know, probably at least I would say a third of them really did quite well. Um, and we came into really big, you know, opportunities um, as a result of those funds. Um, and so I started looking at a fund to funds approach to, you know, solve some of the diversification issues. But you still needed to figure out how do you cut the hold time because the hold time for all these things was taking ten or fifteen years, right? Uh, individual companies were taking nine, ten, eleven, twelve years or more uh, to IPO, and funds were certainly taking more like fifteen years to you know get to meaningful you know uh, overall returns um, and so we had we had done some secondary sales um, at the company level when I was at 500 um, and I personally had you know thought about hey I, I have a you know fair amount of money on the table with my carry in 500 fund one and two and I was looking for some ways to get liquidity and diversification you know, out of that you know long story short I ended up figuring out a way to sell a portion of my, my carry in my first two funds of your carry, not a, not of your GP commit. Uh, my carry, but at the time, you know, this 500 fund one was already in carry, and 500 fund two had Canva and was heading, you know, pretty good situation. But you know, I had a fair amount of money on the table, eight, you know, eight figures certainly, but all unrealized. 
And I wanted to realize some of that. <laughs> and so I started looking around for how do I do that? And, you know, selling a position in a fund is much harder than selling it in an individual company. And selling a position in carry is much harder than even just, you know, a normal fund asset. And so it took a while. I, I probably spent four or five months trying to figure out who to sell to, how to sell, what was the structure. And in a good market, in a very strong market in 2020, I, I still had to, you know, effectively sell about a 30% or more discount, had to make some guarantees on returns, had to, you know, deal with a larger maybe uh, sale size that I was originally thinking about. And that, that whole process just made me realize how complicated it was. And I was pretty sure I wasn't the only person who had this problem. Uh, and so like, well, there's there's clearly a need in the market for other GPs, for other LPs to sell at least partial, you know, positions in funds somewhere between year five to 10. And, and you know, clearly in our funds by year eight, we saw some interesting performance that wasn't obvious before year eight. Well, I mean, you know, at least by only around year four or five, you're still trying to figure shit out. And so what I noticed was a lot of these funds kind of have this, you know, um, outperformance that happens between year five to 10. And if you think about it mathematically, when you're making investments in a fund, most of your investments are wrong. <laughs> and most of your winners, at least in the beginning, are still small. And they, and they don't start getting to meaningful size until maybe, you know, series B or C when they're maybe 10, 20 X the original size. And so what we kind of noticed was, you know, the power loss starts taking off around year seven, eight. And, you know, clearly by year 10, 12, you know, those companies become most of the value um, of, of their fund. But maybe around year five, it's not quite so obvious um, that those things are going to be big. Um, and so a lot of funds don't look that great around year five, six, uh, but by year eight, nine, 10, they start being a lot better, at least some of them, right? And so that was really what we were trying to figure out was like, okay, there's there's clearly some kind of power law thing that takes off by year 10. And so this was basically like showing the trajectory of a fund over 10 or more years. And it really takes more like 15 for most funds these days. And so let's say you had an initial fund that was like 30 or 40 companies at seed or pre-seed. Maybe if you're good or lucky, a third of those, maybe more than a third, but we'll get to series A. So you might have 10 companies that get to series A out of 30 or 40. And then maybe half of those get to series B and then maybe half of those get to series C, right? And so somewhere around B and C, probably that takes about five years or so to go from you know seed or pre-seed to series B. And maybe by series C, you have possibly three to five bigger wins out of that initial 30, 40, 50, right? The top 10%. And you're still not an IPO, but at least you've got some number of companies that get to that Series B or C or later stage. And and so we were like, well, that's probably interesting. Maybe like one out of three funds has that level of success that's detectable. And so if we could sort of just buy positions in those funds after five years, maybe around year seven, uh, that would be great, right? We'd cut off that initial J curve, that initial like depressed performance in the first five years while you're still waiting for your losers to, to fail and while you're still waiting for your winners to get big. We were like, oh, that's that's great. That's brilliant. We can jump in and buy that position when the IRR is accelerating. And then they were like, well, wait, who's going to sell? <laughs> who's going to sell you know, positions in a good fund? Well, institutional investors aren't going to sell, generally speaking. They're long-term patient capital. Um, the fund managers, if they're established, you know, they're, you know, Sequoia is not selling their GP positions or anything, usually. Um, and so really what we realized, it was non-institutional LPs and smaller emerging GPs that might take that trade. This was me you know, running 500 when we were in the first five or six years. And so they might be sitting on a two, three, four X, you know, markup after seven years. And maybe they'd, they'd sell that for, you know, maybe just their cash back or maybe ideally more like, you know, 1.5 to two X back. And for emerging managers, people who are VCs in their first 10 years, first, you know, two or three funds, they might sell, you know, a piece of their um, performance, uh, either, you know, their carry or their overall fund in order to generate DPI. And I think that's exactly the problem we are facing today in the industry. And it's a ton of fund managers who are in their first 10 years of their career, maybe even the first five years of their career, and they have a lot of paper markups, but not a lot of DPI. For funds, maybe up to five years, people don't necessarily care about DPI, but starting around year five and certainly by year seven to 10, people do start caring about DPI and LP certainly care about it. And so you kind of have to have an eye for how you're going to make this trade-off between unrealized TDPI and realized DPI around year seven. Um, and particularly when you look at funds that are sitting at three, four, five X TBPI, but zero or less than 0 0.5 X DPI, people start to ask some questions like, well, you have all this great performance. Why hasn't it been realized? And everybody's like, well, it takes a long time for these companies to get public. I'm like, okay, yes, but are you doing any hedging and other diversification strategies to make sure that you realize some of that? 
And what they're really talking about is, you know, can you take some money off the table? Essentially, you're also trying to, obviously, there's the Lexingtons and the Ardians and the industries of the world. You're trying to right size it and go not directly compete with those players. Uh, definitely not. I mean, I think if you look at like Blackstone, Lex Lexington, Collar Capital, others that are very, very large in private equity, they've been around for 20 years. They're dealing with huge, you know, multi billion dollar funds, in some cases, multi 10, 20 billion dollar funds. Um, and they're making really, really large secondary transactions, you know, billion dollar individual transactions sometimes in private equity portfolios. Um, in venture, uh, folks like Industry Ventures and Stepstone, which acquired Greenspring and a few others are, are pretty large. They're managing multi-billion dollar portfolios. I think, I'm not quite sure, but I think Industry raised recently a one and a half billion dollar fund. I think Stepstone has a $2 billion secondary fund. So their, their check sizes are probably 30, 40, 50 million. Um, maybe, maybe they do a few things that are smaller than that, but not, not much smaller than 10 million. And we're really typically doing one to $5 million checks, at least in most cases. You've gone from deploying uh, one to $2 million pockets, returning 60X, returning 40X, then starting 500 startups, uh, returning somewhere between a, a six to 10X when all is said and done on the first fund and, and building a lot of interesting franchises. And now kind of you've developed a product that kind of dog fooded your own product on the secondary side. Now you want to bring it, bring it to the funds. What would you like our audience to know about you and about Practical VC? We are a secondary investor in venture capital funds and companies. So we, we buy positions, LP and GP interest in funds, as well as in companies, mostly at the fund level, but also at the company level. Uh, typically looking for, you know, portfolios that already have winners, at least at series B or C or later. Um, so for us, the sweet spot is probably, you know, not necessarily multi-billion dollar companies, although that's obviously great, but usually what we're looking for are companies that are doing at least, let's say 20, 30, 40 million in revenue and up. So, so probably on the low end, those are, you know, companies valued at a couple hundred million, maybe the high end are valued at, you know, single digit billions, but sweet spots probably, you know, I would say between 200 million to 2 billion. Um, and those are companies that are probably doing, you know, a minimum of 20 million in revenue. I think we're going to see a massive expansion in the secondary market as a result of this downturn, that, that typically happens every time there's a big downturn. The, the secondary market, people realize, oh yeah, we need liquidity, we need secondary. And usually there's not enough secondary whenever you have the downturn. <laughs> it takes a while for people to, to see the writing on the wall. It's a painful, painful uh, realization process. Well, Dave, uh, as I mentioned, I, I first went to your talk in 2009. I, w I wish I knew where it was. It was probably somewhere around Palo Alto. Uh, it was you know one of those meetups those used to be like the main main di information dissemination uh, areas, but I did use your uh, pirate metrics in, in my startup uh, to different degrees of success, <laughs> but definitely not your fault. Um, <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. By popular demand, the 10X Capital Podcast has officially launched our newsletter powered by Caria Labs, a full service content marketing firm that's partnering with us on the newsletter. In our weekly newsletter, we will keep you updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners, including industry trends that are critical to know as an LP, VC, or founder. To subscribe to our totally free newsletter, please visit 10xcapitalpodcast.com. Again, that's 10xcapitalpodcast.com. We thank you for your support.